The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. These facts few psychologists will dispute, and their admitted truth must establish for all time the genuineness and dignity of the weirdly horrible tale as a literary form. Howard Phillips Lovecraft, Supernatural Horror in Literature. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. We've been doing a lot of high and low fantasy in this series, but focusing on just that is seeing a forest for the trees. Let's rectify that with a little bit of SF, shall we? Science fiction and horror have always gone hand in hand, no doubt because of the amounts we don't know about space. Even more appropriately, spaceships lend themselves to confined areas, so that's at least two fears that can be drawn upon. This brings us to today's subject, The Void, an SF horror game made by the same folks who made Cthulhu Tech. The Void's premise is that of a future where much of the solar system has been colonized for quite some time. A mysterious stellar object known as the Chthonian Star has appeared, bringing with it horrors long slumbering. The interstellar governmental body known as the Unified World Council has established a group of investigators called Wardens, whose job it is to investigate these threats, to contain or eliminate them, and keep the population from finding out. Now, drawing on Eldritch Horror is nothing new for Wildfire, but their previous outing was criticized for its writing late in its run, I don't completely agree with that, and for one of the most swingy dice systems ever encountered. I definitely agree with that. The Void, on the other hand, is more towards hard science fiction and Wildfire's Eldritch twists. And does it commit? Well, let's find out. The Void is aiming to be an accessible game for its genre. In terms of presentation, it certainly shows. For lack of a better term, The Void reads like a PDF more than a book. While it's around 242 pages, its larger text and slightly smaller text space makes it a much easier read than some other entries. Artwork isn't as frequent as their previous work, but what there is is well done and gets its point across. Additionally, Wildfire's skill with inserting little story seeds is present here. If I really want to stretch it, I do wish there were more setting pieces in the book, or some kind of in-universe brochure image like there was in Cthulhu Tech. There's some of that here, but a bit more could help establish a visual identity. Beyond that, there's not much that stands out positively or negatively, aside from a few typos that are par for the course. It's just a solid presentation all around. Character creation takes one of two forms, template-based and freeform, with the former being the one that's introduced first. Templates are best described as semi-auto character generation, a feature that I see a lot in Japanese tabletop, where it contains a foundation, but there's still aspects you can tinker with. Because of that, we'll delve into the primary aspects of character generation before character creating itself. First is attributes, the character's innate capacities. The six attributes here are awareness, cleverness, demeanor, grace, perseverance, and physique. Attributes are rated 1 to 5. Two statistics that are derived from this are health and speed. The former is derived from the sum of their grace, perseverance, and physique, while the latter is the sum of grace and physique. Second is skills, which represent the character's training and education. Like attributes, skills are rated from 1 to 5. Third is qualities, which are positive and negative traits that affect the character, a fairly standard affair for most people who are familiar with point-by systems and RPGs. Fourth are talents, special actions and techniques that are either passive or active during play. And finally, there's quirks, which can be interpreted as micro-skills that have a specific use in a personal sense. Since we're using the template approach, character creation is in four steps which we'll be using for our warden here, named Corvin Marlix Jr., a former pilot who turned to detective work before he became a warden. First is birthplace, which relative planet, or planetoid, we hail from in the solar system. Looking through the different options, we'll go with Ganymede, meaning that he was born on Troy. This gives him a free rank in three skills, fraternize, freefall, and streetwise. Second, your primary specialty. There are three specialties for wardens, each based on a specific aspect. Enforcers are the combatants, investigators are the information experts, and the knowledge-centric researchers. Of these three, the investigator seems the most appropriate. The choice in specialty determines starting attributes and available skills. Attributes have an initial spread, to which we can allocate five points. Distributing them results in his attributes becoming Awareness 5, Cleverness 3, Demeanor 4, Grace 3, Perseverance 3, and Physique 2. 
Next is skills from your primary and secondary specialty. For the primary, you have 30 points to spend on skills from the specialty skill list, the first three ranks costing one point. Going from rank 3 to 4 costs 2 points, and from 4 to 5 costs 3 points. After distributing these points, we get the following skills. Defense 3, Guns, Handguns 3, Fraternize 1, Freefall 1, Insight 3, Investigate 4, Law 2, Notice 3, Persuade 3, Reaction 3, Streetwise 3, and Unarmed Combat 3. The secondary specialty can be thought of as career skills, in a sense. In this step, we choose two specialties and assign 10 points to the associated skills. We'll be assigning two points to each skill in the pilot and former undercover cop, with the exception of law only spending one and impersonation spending three. This makes his final skill spread as follows. Art, acting two, astrogation two, defense three, gunner shipboard weapons two, guns, handguns three, fraternize one, freefall one, hand weapons improvise three, insight three, Impersonation 2, Investigate 4, Law 3, Notice 3, Odd Job 2, Persuade 3, Pilot Atmospheric 2, Pilot Spacecraft 2, Reaction 3, Sensors 2, Streetwise 3, Unarmed Combat 3. We'll add in our quirks at this phase, which in this case gives us a rating in 2 in Cold Reading, Spaceship Knowledge, and Literary Knowledge. Next are Qualities. We have 5 points to spend on Advantages, and may gain 12 of disadvantages. For advantages, we'll spend 2 on fast, 2 on tough, 2 on hard to kill, 3 on fearless, and 1 on gifted metabolism. For disadvantages, we gain 3 from nightmares and 2 from enemy. Finally, we choose 1 talent from the list. Of the group provided, we'll go with double tap. The creation setup does a nice job of not having skill systems get overwhelming. However, I think that the 3 primary and 4 secondary specialties is a little bit small even with the broad skill and talent lists. Also, just one starting talent seems a little restrained in order to give some distinctiveness. I'd probably add a second one or a third one as a house rule. In either case, the archetype setup is a pretty straightforward way to make a character quickly, but the full form version is there for the more experienced folk. I might do this character experiment again with a full form version down the line, but time will tell on that matter. Many games outside of the bubble of the alleged world's greatest RPG use a success-based dice pool. The Void is no exception to this. Most of the rolls are skill-based and use a number of d6s equal to the attribute and skill ratings total. With 5s and 6s, unless you're solely using an attribute which only uses 6s for successes, counting as successes against a target difficulty number. While this approach is standard fare, the Void does have a few twists on the formula. For starters, triggers. A trigger occurs when you roll at least one more success than you need to meet the target difficulty. Triggers are primarily important to activate certain talents. For example, Corvin has Double Tap, which allows him to use a trigger on a handgun attack to make a second attack at a minus one penalty. Secondly, the Hail Mary rule. This is an all or nothing roll when you don't have enough dice to meet a roll's difficulty. You can still make an attempt to succeed, but all of the dice must hit. If you do, you can roll another die and add it as a success, if it lands on a 6, repeating until you match the difficulty. As said before, The Void is a horror SF work, and thus I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the horror and madness tests. Horror tests recur whenever a fight or flight instinct might be triggered. Whenever this happens, the subject rolls a perseverance test against a specific difficulty. Failing that requires a roll on the horror effect chart, which determines how you might react against this fear. Madness, on the other hand, is rarer and with much higher stakes. Like horror, madness is a perseverance check. Failing this invokes a level of madness from level 1 to 4. The higher levels require more time to recover, usually days of therapy. If someone's inflicted with level 4 madness, then they're completely gone. The Void doesn't have an extra effort mechanic, but it does have an extra life resource of a sort with fate points. Every character starts a session with one fate point and only has one throughout the session. You regain the fate point in the session after next if you spend it. There are technically two ways to spend it, but for all intents and purposes they cover the same ground saving you from something that should have killed you otherwise. While the mechanics are very to the point, they get their job done. Combat is certainly downplayed with how brutal things can get, given the amount of damage even simple pistols can do. An encounter in the void will be tied to something out of this world, obviously, so that certainly makes sense. If I had one issue, it's the lack of a sanity system. I get trying to not downplay the horror, but I feel like the way it handles horror might be a little too unforgiving for some. The Void is aiming for accessibility, and for the most part I'd say it succeeds. 
Even at 242 pages, the book is a breeze to go through. There's not a whole lot of cross-reference involved, and the mechanics all have summarized asides to make it easier. While it could be argued that the Eldritch Horde is, is a little overplayed, I don't think this game is dependent on Cthulhu as others might be. Given all that, I feel I can give this game a stamp of strongly recommended. If nothing else, it shows that despite the issues with their previous work, Wildfire is not without ability. I'd highly recommend looking into it for a one-shot, or to bring in new players into trying out horror games. Granted, this game is going to have the same issues that horror games have, so I can't quite advise using it in a convention game. In addition, I'll say it'll do enough if you've already got a game like Call of Cthulhu or Chill that you use as your horror fix. For a free game, though, there's not much risk in trying it out.